Here we are, once again, episode 24 yep. of the Wild Times podcast. This is our first live stream. Thank Woo-woo. you if you're tuned in for joining us. If you don't know who I am, I'm Forrest Galante, wildlife biologist. <laughs> Pardon me, wildlife broologist. <laughs> I'm you. joined today. You planned. Yeah. Thank you. Joined today by um, the producer, Mr. Patrick DeLuca. He's got a chain on. That's a new look. Um, his hair is getting long. I'm pretty sure he's going to sell me a used car pretty soon. Um, Here's what it is. I'm 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 getting old, and so I'm yeah. trying to do what a lot of old people in California do, which is compensate with, like, dressing younger. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's what I'm how, doing. Mm-hmm. How tight we are your tell. jeans? <laughs> my, my jeans are incredibly tight, and there's a huge hole in the crotch. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and uh, as well as the uh, the ancient yet dressing down producer, we have the professor with us, Mr. Ritep. He's joining us live from Reseda, as he likes to remind us every single week. You always week, ask. As if there's anything interesting about oh, that God. at all. There is something uh, interesting today. <laughs> the entire fucking place is covered in a thick layer of smoke and the whole and California is on fire. So, uh, Oh boy. <laughs> Matt, Matt McHugh just destroyed. <laughs> Matt McHugh just got Peter real hard. Does Peter have what Tourette's or is just a comfy chair to wiggle in for the whole podcast? Oh God, I, I heard last time. I'm really going to try and uh, rein that in this time. I was watching last time, just getting fucking pissed at myself. I was like, sit still. So distracting. I'm on cocaine, Matt. Eat a dick. All right, let's get into this. Let's get into this. How, how are you guys? You're everybody's home. We're all home. That's, that's a change. Dude, we have the, I'm sorry. We have the funniest. We must have the funniest listeners of any podcast. Why? They're all making me laugh. I can't stop reading the comments. (laughs) Knock it off. They're calling me. They're saying I look like a discount Chris (laughs) D'Elia. And, uh, And Miguel Brito is just ragging on the the professor for looking like a potato. It's he great. is a potato. It's great, yeah. and I'm in my boxer briefs too. So let's get this rolling. Peter, just why don't you give why don't you give the people what they want? Why don't you pop that shirt off? Hell no, dude! I got a fucking B <laughs> cup roll in here. I haven't I haven't <laughs> worked out in a month, man. There's no way. <laughs> If I can get oh, if I can man. get three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in donations, I'll pop the shirt off. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that'll happen soon. I don't yeah, even know how people would donate. <laughs> all right, so Forrest, let's start off with a little sip. We all have our drinks for the drinking game. We're going to play along. Vodka lemonade here. What do you got nice. there, boy? I got a fat tire. It's not, it's, it's been a long day. I drove in from Oregon today, so. Yeah, so what's going on up there, dude? I didn't realize, we're in California. We're always fucked with fires, but Oregon's like apparently really bad. I'm, I guess I missed it the last couple of days. Ugh, it's a disaster. 10% of the entire state has been evacuated. Think of that. Ooh, 10% that's fucking nuts. The entire that's, state has been evacuated. I didn't know that. Holy shit, dude. How, that's like millions of people, yeah? I think it's f- about 500,000. Um, okay. I have to take a look. It's it's not millions, but it's... Uh-huh. Um, look, it's crazy, though. Like, all jokes aside, so I was on this big road trip for anybody that's been following along either on the pod or, or on... Um, on social media and we, we went, you know, all the way up to into Montana, crossing a few States and then dropping down through, through Washington and Oregon. And I was out camping. I was telling the story before we were recording. Um, and I was out camping and woke up on the rogue river trout fishing and was like, huh, sky don't look so good. And, uh, drove into town and town was just, it was abandoned and it was super weird. I came back this over the hill on this dirt road popped down into the small town, um, in Oregon and there wasn't one person there. And I was like, huh, this doesn't seem right. Like is, it is 2020. Like maybe there's an actual apocalypse, uh, drove <laughs> yeah. around, drove around town for like five minutes and then got on the highway or like the main road leading out of town and caught up to a police barricade. And those, those were the first people I saw. And I was like, Jesus, what is going on? Um, and, uh, and the police were just like, Hey, get out of here. Like this whole town's evacuated. What are you doing? I was like, Oh, I was Oof. camping like two hours down dirt roads that way. And they're like, yeah, get the hell out of here. Like you're right by the fire. I'm <laughs> oh like, my great. God. They're like, do you not smell it? Stupid. Right. What's wrong was, with her nose? You can't, t- you couldn't tell that everything was like on fire and you couldn't see like, what, how was the smoke there and shit? I mean, when I went, I got, I, we got in two days prior. It was beautiful, crystal clear air. Everything was fine. Mm. Fish for, fish for a day, whatever, went to bed. Woke up the next morning and it was uh, it was orange sky, but like you couldn't smell smoke. I mean, everything smells like smoke. I'm camping. Right? Yeah, it's so true. It was, there's no distinguishing factor. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and yeah, it was just like, all right, something's amiss. I mean, I look, I knew there was a fire. I didn't know it was as severe as it was. And then, yeah, just it canceled all the rest of my trip plans. So hightailed it home from Oregon, uh, between yesterday and today and made it in like an hour ago. Well, wow. So Peter, you've got a new nickname from the listeners, the Brotato. The Brotato. Yeah, I saw it. I'm glad I could step on that for you, you dickhead. I saw how happy you were about to say it out loud. Dude, I feel like an asshole because Forrest was talking about people being evacuated and their homes burning down, and I was laughing at the same time yeah, because I know. of Brotato. I know. You're very distracted by the live tra- chat, dude. Get your head in the game. Only look every once in a while. Whoa. Pay attention. Well, you know? People you are in- on live. We got to interact. That's the whole point. No. All right. I know. I know. I know. All right. Uh, wait. So. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, go ahead. so, um, I mean, forest out here, like I went outside today. I haven't seen the sun. First of all, it's been sunny. The, the, uh, the weather forecast for the past three days has just been smoke and like, you can't see the sun at all. It's fucking insane. Like, is this going to fuck up just the, the smoke alone? Cause it's covering the entire West coast. Like the fires are obviously destroying things up and down the coast. Does the smoke and the blocking out the sun actually fuck up the environment and animals or anything like that? Um, yeah, th- look, that's a good question. It's what, what, the, what are the you direct thing about you fucking cunt over there. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Giant, air, giant idiot. fires. Giant fires burning down natural habitat doesn't affect the animals at all. No. <laughs> That's why I fucking disclaimed it with, of course, well, the fires are going to destroy right, 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 right. smoke calm specifically. Down, calm yeah. down. Calm down. Uh, people here, people yeah. should have drink. Have a drink, everybody. Um, have a drink. <laughs> before yeah, everybody us, take a drink. It's everybody a good drink. segue into uh, Mitch's back 12. He is asking about the Tasmanian tiger. Do you think it, I think he's in Australia. He's asking, do you think it's in Australia or Papua New Guinea? Um, when we were in Tasmania the first time, the whole fucking place was on fire, dude. Yeah. The yeah. animals were acting crazy. Yeah. So, all right, two-parter here. First of all, yes, big fires definitely cause big problems um, for wildlife. When we filmed the pilot of Extinctor Alive, and here we go, Extinctor Alive behind the scenes story. When we filmed the pilot <laughs> of Extinctor Alive, um, is that a drink? Yeah. If Extinctor Alive sure. behind the scenes, I believe that's a, a booze drink. Cheers, mates. Cheers. So when Get we filmed the pilot of Extinctor Alive, we went to look for the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger. Um, and when we <laughs> went there, we went to Tasmania during the largest fire that the, the state of Tasmania has ever seen. And when we hit the ground, we were like, holy shit, like we have to leave. Like this is, this is terrible, right? And Patrick, you'll remember we sat there and, and we we're sitting around and I was like, you know what? This is fantastic. And you're like, what are you talking about? This is not fantastic. And I was like, yes, it is. It's like, look at the fire. Look at the topography. You know, the fire is sweeping down this this entire part of the coast, or not the coast, but part of the country, the state rather, and there's canyons running down either side with mountains. It's making a natural funnel for wildlife to escape the fire. There is going to be a corridor effect where if we sit at the mouth in between these two giant peaks, all the animals uh, uh, fleeing from the fire are going to run right by us. And you, you might remember, Patrick, that very first night, as we went out with the thermal imaging binoculars, yeah. it looked like the African Serengeti. I mean, it was just thousands of wombats and wallabies and yeah. creatures as far as the eye could see. And it was just unbelievable. And we were like, holy shit, we are in the perfect place. If there is going to be a thylacine evacuating from the fire, it's undeniably going to come down this canyon where we are. And hopefully the fire <laughs> isn't right behind it because it'll burn us to a crisp. But um, it, uh, it was really cool. I mean, it, it actually, it's interesting how if you think a little bit creatively outside the box, you can use things like natural disasters to manipulate results or not results, but rather manipulate your search and help you uh, when you would think, Oh shit, I just got to run away, which was awesome. So that brings me back to Mitch's back 12's question. Do you, do you think that the Tasmanian tiger, if still alive is in Tasmania, mainland Australia or Papua New Guinea? I know the answer. Great question. Do you know the answer? Well, I know what you think. I, I think. Yeah. Get into um, that, I think that's fascinating. Totally. So 4,000 years ago, we know that there were thylacine all the way from PNG, Papua New Guinea, all the way down to Tasmania, right? With the introduction of man came their canines, which are wild dogs named dingoes. Now, the dingoes outcompeted the thylacine. As that, in addition to hunting pressure, is what led to the thylacine's believed extinction. Now, stay with me, baby birds. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now if you take into account the fact that dingoes have a certain preferred habitat versus thylacine, which like 
very remote, very quiet forested habitat, and dingoes like more open savanna lands and grasslands, you would think that with the checkerboard that is Australian habitat, there would be these pockets of area where the thylacine could remain. Now, the reason that the thylacine was around until the 40s, oh, geez, I'm blanking, 1900s. in Tasmania, yeah. yeah, in Tasmania, was because of the fact that dingoes never made it to Tasmania. Well, we know that hunters essentially wiped out the thylacine in Tasmania. <laughs> I do believe that they could still be there. Now, <laughs> now stay with me. I do think there's a chance that there's thylacine in Tasmania. I don't believe there are any in mainland Australia anymore. I am convinced that in Papua New Guinea, in the highlands, the same place that just, just, just three days ago they found singing dogs, which they presumed had been extinct for 50 years in the wild. They found them in, in, Tas in uh, Papua New Guinea, if you look this up, by the way. Fucking fantastic discovery. I yeah. believe in that same habitat could be thylacine. T Papua New Guinea is the least explored, most rugged, most difficult place on earth. I mean, it is, it's just, it's, it's hard to even fathom how hard it is to explore Papua New Guinea biologically and just from, this, the, from the standpoint of exploring on foot. And I think that is the place that harbors the thylacine. Dude, that's so cool, man. If, so a couple of people have just asked about season three on Extinct or, uh, of Extinct or Alive. Uh, Matt McHugh, Alex Dunn, um, we talked about Papua New Guinea as a definite episode, yeah. a thylacine episode there, if season three happens, uh, which right now is on hold, uh, sort of indefinitely because of COVID. So yep. we, will, Thanks, COVID. We, were, we were greenlit. Uh, we will keep you up to date. But uh, like many people's lives, things changed and... None of us are sick, so we have nothing to complain about. We'll yep. go to Papua New Guinea either way, whether it's for Extinct or Alive or something else we do. For the wild, wild times. times trip? Yeah, wild exactly. times trip. Let's do it next week. Uh, my, it guess would be, my guess would be Reteb would last 34 minutes total. Dude, oh, I, he would, I, you guys well, are hilarious. Uh, first of all, I could beat both of you in a fist fight, even at the same time. Second of all, <laughs> I've been an adventurer my entire fucking life. Just because it's documented with you guys and you guys... You know, you go out there and, and you're world famous for it. Doesn't mean that all of us regular folk, are, us, I'll consider myself a brosner, can't fucking manage. Uh, you're, you're not that uh, special, all right? Come on. Fuck let, let no, I clear. actually, Every Forrest one of QR, the brosners Pat, would do Pat better can, than you. Sorry. Yeah, if Pat, exactly. If Pat can survive somewhere, I can survive in that place and a place that's a hundred times worse because he's a meager little pussy. Here's the problem. They don't serve deep dish pizza in the jungle. <laughs> I don't know when the last time I've had deep dish pizza is, mate. You know that Dead an adventure to going, going to Taco Bell at 3 a.m. wasted Ooh. is not considered an oh. adventure. Taco Bell was mentioned. Oh, That's yeah. a drink. Forrest, you sent me a great one today. It was... Uh, it was a uh, baby food. Shut up. I had to take a drink. It was a picture of baby <laughs> food that was flavored like my favorite Taco Bell item, which is the five layer uh, beefy burrito, beefy cheesy burrito, whatever the fuck it's called. And uh, I mean, you want to get your kids started early on Taco Bell flavors is all I'm saying, because it's a very cheap source of food. One of, one of my favorite Brosners just commented, if anyone is going to find the thylacines, it'll be Forrest. It was uh, Ryan Hardy. And he sent me a message on Instagram and uh, his name is Tan, his name is Tan Ryan Hardy. And I went to his profile and it just says, I am Ryan. I am Tan. <laughs> I love the brosters, dude. That's the kind of people I want listening to this show. Yeah, you guys. Exactly. Ryan, keep, keep tanning. Peter, how do you feel about the fact that you're not currently tanning? It's rough. There's no sun. And even though, you know, when it's normally cloudy, you can still get tan through the clouds, but not through the smoke. The smoke Interesting. completely blocks the sun. I, and also, I can't take my shirt off because I've gained 25 pounds and look like a potato. Fuck off. Well, I thought you were on a big workout, like fitness thing. What? You were looking good. You were tank topping it like three episodes ago. <laughs> tank like, topping it. Yeah, dude. dude you I'm were going sh sleeves optional. I've gotten myself day. into a relationship. You know what happens. Put on the comfort weight already. I got to gotta kick good. it back into gear. That's smart. You know, start early with that. You really want to show her how repulsive you are right off the bat. Well, if we do go to, Smart. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I mean, you, you spend the first maybe six to six to seven weeks being real cool and fit, pretending you work out and then you can just fucking let it go. I mean, how long does it take to, to, to get, to get yourself sold in a relationship? Brosner's way in. 
I don't know, but so, I do want to tell you this. Kathy Church just pointed something out that I think is pretty significant for you, Peter, which is that tan fat equals skinny, and everyone knows that. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> what? It's, yeah, fuck working out. Just get tan. <laughs> That's right. Dude, it's so true. I was, uh, I, I uh, maybe 10 years ago, was going for like a beach vacation, and it was like, it came at a time where I was like working really hard, like not working out, not like, I was the worst. It was like the grossest I've ever looked. And I actually got a spray tan. No. Wait, you've looked no closer than what you look like right now? It would be like if I went to the beach now, yeah. And so uh, I got a spray tan and literally I looked at myself in the mirror. It was way too dark. Like it was, people probably were like, cool spray tan, bro. Uh, I, was an ad- I was an Adonis instantly. <laughs> you Being know, tan <laughs> takes 25 yeah. pounds of fat off the body. Yeah, I love I mean, that you got a spray tan. That's a, like not didn't go to a tanning bed or lay outside on your very nice deck. You got a spray tan. Does a spray tan spray actually tan protect the skin like a normal tan would, or at least to some degree? Or is it just nonsense to make you look better? It's probably chemical that causes. It's probably pure carcinogen they spray on you. We have all right. Qu- so this we is have a, we have a question okay, I want to get in, it. and then I'm gonna let you go. But just re- I'm gonna let you go on with your bullshit. But Daniel wants to know uh, <laughs> if the Producer ever blinks. No, he doesn't. I've never. It's, he's like a robot. Yeah, yeah. He, he has to try. So when you tell him to, he'll close <laughs> his eyes. But you'll notice they don't even close at the same time. It's like he tries to. Yeah, he's, he's a weird fuck. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> After I read all your questions last week. Uh, <laughs> so this came across my desk and I found this That's fascinating. A That's a drink. Oh, cheers. Yeah, it is. God. I love that you don't even know. <laughs> I forgot that that was it's a rule. Great. All right. Yep. So good rule. Back in the day, and producer Will didn't put a uh, exact date, but it apparently lasted well into the 19th century. So well into the 1800s, in India, Ooh. people used to get sentenced. A, a common death sentence involved elephants. Mm. They oh. would use elephants publicly to create these lavish deaths. So they would either tie ropes to people's uh, hands and feet mm. and then tie them to the elephants and have the elephants walk apart and oh, tear the limbs off. God, that or sounds miserable. they would have the elephants trample them or sometimes, sometimes, they would have the elephant place its foot over the person's head and then step down and squish the head. I got, I, got one even, I got one even better than that. So uh, Will, maybe you can pull up an image of this if you can find it. Um, when I was in Bangkok in Thailand, um, I went to a place called the Torture Museum, which is a, this very odd little museum in Bangkok. And it has left such an impression on me because one of the main things there was the ways they would torture people with animals. And there was all kinds of crazy stuff. But the one that really stood out in my mind was done with an elephant. And what it was was they'd, they'd take a prisoner – and they put him in this little bamboo ball that was woven. You know how bamboo bends when you kind of split it down the middle? It gets that very flexible. That's why they make mats out of it. Yeah. So they make this bamboo ball, and they put the victim, the, the person they were trying to get information in, out of into the bamboo ball, and then they drive a bunch of nails and spikes into the bamboo. So imagine a human hamster ball covered with nails poking oh, in on the inside. God, no. Then they'd roll oh. it out into a field and let the elephants play soccer with it. And the elephants would just oh, kick it around God. like a game while you're inside getting twisted and tor- turned around in this uh, in this torture hamster wheel um, until that... you had enough and would give the information. Uh, the question, are there other animals that torture, that torture <laughs> other living creatures? I-, I seriously hate humans. Like, it's ridiculous. So... It, that's a crazy, so Forrest and I, um, produced a show together that was just absolute trash. Is that the torture ball? <laughs> there it is. We'll pull it up full screen. Oh, it's brutes. So what do we got here? Yeah. This so Forrest, this is the human is inside this torture ball. Yeah. Will, can you make that any bigger by chance? Can you click that, that sucker? Um, that's what, that's get it erect, said. get it erect. Yeah. But it, yeah. yeah. So that's the ball. You see kind of the, the bamboo weaving. Right. And the person is inside of that. And all the nails are then spiking in. And like I said, they taught these elephants to legit play soccer. Play so the soccer. elephants wouldn't crush it. They would just Jesus. pass it around um, getting. Yeah. Oh, well, just, it, I thought well, it was so. I mean, uh, so, yeah, I'm definitely so they were, curious to hear about this, Pat. Yeah. So so we did the show and it was all about sort of famous it, um, in, instances where 
there were mass attacks on humans uh, by animals. And there were two, we didn't end up even getting to one of these episodes, but there were two uh, different stories from World War II where uh, Japanese ship captains, Navy captains, um, they had taken hostages or prisoners or whatever from one of the allied countries (laughs) and they uh, would chum the water. There's two different times, two different guys did it. Chum the water, get a big shitload of pelagic sharks in. Uh, Forrest, I think, speculated they might have been oceanic white tips. Get a bunch of sharks in a crazy frenzy and then push as many as like 65 or 70 people overboard so that they would just all get just attacked by sharks. That's that's, And and they're famous incidents that are documented. Yeah, that's wild. It's pretty nuts given like, you know, it's funny because one of the things that Patrick and I strive to do when we make TV is like break down the shitty misconception that these animals are all mindless killing machines, right? Mm -hmm. And then you hear a story like this where a whole group of people would just chum the waters, get people, get, get the sharks going nuts and then drive humans in to get them eaten by sharks as a, as a method of torture, which is just, I don't know. It's bonkers. It's like, I swear they're not bad animals, but it's people that make them bad. Right? Somebody, it's not yeah. the animals themselves. Somebody in here said that uh, whales torture seals. Is that true? Uh, there is an element of truth to that. Um, it's kind of the way, you know, you'd say a cat tortures a mouse. Um, they're not really doing it for the sake of torture, but the cat is playing with its food. Oh, killer right? whales. That, yeah, Blake. Yeah, yeah, yeah Blake Harwell. Yeah. Hey, so... And, Oh, sorry. Same go ahead, Forrest. Thing. No, it's the so, same thing. Killer whales will play with uh, with their their prey as a means of advancing social um, convention and understanding, and and just play, just the way your cat does with a mouse. So yeah, pretty much. Other animals do something. Okay, so they like. So while well, most food, most gotcha. of the listeners are just making Brosner. fun of, Brosners are making fun of us. Uh, Cole Riley actually asks a, a wildlife related question for us. He wants oh, to know. So he said, "I love the wildlife in California. I spent a lot of time in the wilderness." So he's used to all sorts of different uh, flora and fauna. And he said a few weeks ago, he had a doe with a fawn cross in front of him. And the doe charged at him. Oh, interesting. I'm, sorry, I'm assuming Cole is a, a male. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, what, what do you think about that? Is that, is that shocking? Is that something that... What, what do you think? Um, it, I would say it's a little bit shocking. I mean, maternal instincts are always strong, Um they're not always strong. Maternal instincts will always take place when presented that opportunity, right? I recall one time where I was working up here in the foothills of Santa Barbara, and I found a very young fawn um, that was stuck on the wrong side of a fence. And it was so young. I mean, it was it was up and walking, but it could barely run or hop. And it was trying to jump through this fence. And it couldn't. Its mother was somehow on the other side of this, this crappy wire fence. So I went over and I caught the fawn and I went to pick it up. And as I went to pick it up and drop it over the fence, the mother came running at me at full speed and just bounced off this fence. And I felt really sad for her because I obviously didn't want the mom to get hurt. I was just trying to return the baby to the mom. Mm-hmm. Um, you should have known better, here, broologist. There was no other option, guy. All right. You don't, you don't, um, you don't leave you the fawn in that You have a death wish and no amygdala. Guy. That's correct. Regular people have um, other options. <laughs> but anyway, back to the story. Yes, the maternal instinct will take over. If, if a mom feels her baby is in jeopardy, of course, she's going to do something about it. That being said, Bucks will, and someone actually just wrote this as well, I see. Um, yeah, bucks will absolutely attack hunters during the rut. Um, mm. So the male deer are definitely more aggressive. In fact, I don't know if, Will, you can pull this up. There was a hilarious instance of this like Asian tourist taking this video of this massive elk with this huge rack. I, I want to say it was Yellowstone, but I have no idea where. Uh, that just, just came out like a day or two ago. I think it was on Barstool Outdoors. And uh, this guy is like getting closer and closer. And this elk is just like, I've had enough and just puts its horns down and charges right at this guy. And the guy like holds his ground looking oh, wow. through his phone like a complete dipshit and then turns Jesus. and high tails it. And it's uh, it's pretty funny. <laughs> hey, Man. let me ask you this, Forrest. So I, when you just described the elk charging the guy, it made me think mm-hmm. about, uh, you know, we've we've both been around bear a lot and, you know you're supposed to stand your ground, charge you. And it made me think about this time when I was in seventh grade and, uh, this kid, Adam, I shouldn't say his last name, but he was like this really <laughs> bad, bad kid. And he was really tough. And, um, we were playing basketball outside and I guess some of the other guys decided it would be funny because he would like punch people's faces in, like they would go to the hospital, like in seventh Sounds grade. Sounds like a nice guy. Yeah. And, uh, 
he grabbed my shirt and was like, I've never liked you and cocked his fist back and was like, I'm going to fucking kill you. And, you. and I just stood there frozen. Cause I was like, there's nothing I can do. He was twice my size. He was a psychopath. And, uh, <laughs> he let me go. He started laughing and let me go. And, uh, I just ran and I ran back to my house. When I got back to my house, I was, I was wearing white jean shorts and, uh, <laughs> were they yellow? I was, by the time you I was in utter fear. Yeah. Yeah. They were yellow. Cause I had peed into my jean shorts a bit. It wasn't a full evacuation, but it was a decent amount. And so what, what is it that, what biological or evolutionary function does it do? Does it like, why do you piss or shit yourself in the face of fear? That can't be helpful. I thought you were going to ask this like very useful question about like flight or fight, like why you froze, like what should you have done? And instead you're like, why, you know, why, why, did I, why did I duke my pants? Like what, what happened there? Today? Well, the other uh, thing is our, our uh, dog has at one time, it got really scared and it, and it shit yeah. in fear. I'm so what, I'm more concerned what, what you, that you had white jorts on though. That's dude, the this real was problem. 93, bro. 1993. <laughs> and what's funny is he was wearing the exact same chain he's wearing right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh, Same i don't know the too. answer to that i mean i think what it is is you're probably you know you're holding it in and all of a sudden you're no longer holding it in because you're like i'm not focused on that at all but i really don't know if any of the the brosners know the answer why you evacuate your bo- well, bowels Ka- under extreme fear let us know kathy church actually says that's an adre- an adrenal gland response mm. it makes you oh, lighter okay. it makes you lighter for your escape which oh. makes perfect oh, okay. sense. I don't know if she's right, but it sounds fantastic. Lighter, but it stinkier. Makes, it, it, do, it does make perfect <laughs> sense. That's actually pretty pretty incredible if you think about it. I'm also getting a lot of shit now for the white jorts. Yeah, it's a, a lot. It's, it's bananas. I mean, everybody wore jorts back then, but 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 white ones? I mean, what? Nobody did even that. I, I don't, did you? What do you sorry, I don't want to think my money. mom was made of money? I, <laughs> I was gonna say, I don't want they to weren't problems. always jorts, Peter. At one point in time, they were pants, and his family was poor, so and he owned scissors. Okay, why don't you just back off? <laughs> oh boy, I'm sorry. Kathy Church these. says she has a a degree in biology, so she says, yeah, that's legit. The adrenal gland vacates your your bowels and bladder so that you can escape faster. I mean, that's really cool. Kathy. It also so gives the next you- time I'm being charged by a hippo or lion, I'm going to consciously <laughs> make the decision to just shit all over myself so that I can run slightly faster. Well, let and me, maybe a quick J.O. too. L- l- let me ask you. It would help. Wait. It would help. If you were, if you had somebody by the collar, right, as like a normal semi-decent human being, and then they shit themselves, there's a <laughs> minute chance. Like there's, there's definitely a, a better chance that I would let them go no matter what they had done to me because I would feel so bad. You know, I'd be like, okay, yeah. that's enough. So, I mean, I think that might be... Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't know, but it could be one of the reasons that we shit ourselves. When here's, we're here's another technique. Defense response. If someone's about to beat your ass and they have you by the collar and you can, shit yourself. Yep. And then as you see them catch a whiff, you look into their <laughs> eyes and go, you can beat me as bad as you want, but one thing I know is some of this shit is going in your nose. <laughs> <laughs> I, it would definitely work, man. There's yeah. no doubt about it. <laughs> that's uh, that's the exact tactic that we took on getting DNA for the Rio Apoporus Cayman with the anaconda in the Amazon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, somebody just posted um, about the python that laid seven eggs and had no contact with a mate. Did you hear about that one, Forrest? I did not. Um, what, what is that reproduction called? Because some reptiles can asexual, that. asexual reproduction. No, no. It's, well, it is asexual reproduction, but this the process in which the cells split without copulation is called parthenogenesis. Now, what, what that right. what happened? Right, you right, Peter. Well, right. So, so Redneck yeah. Zeus just asked if we heard. It just says the python laid seven eggs without meeting a mate, and pythons aren't right. But I, I, I want that. you to verify the science, right? It is parthenogenesis. <laughs> That's what I'm checking you. Listen, parthenogenesis. I'll remember for the next pod. All right. So, well, for for us, you're a, you're a herp. Uh, Has it was a, Is that what you mean? <laughs> Sorry, go. It on. was a 62 year old uh, female ball python in the St. Louis Zoo. Okay. Um, laid seven eggs okay. uh, and had had no contact with a uh, with a male ever. I find no. that hard to believe. So there's a couple no. different options. Sorry, there. sorry. Okay. She could have uh, 
she could have had it says she could have had contact with the male in 1990. Yeah, so it's that is likely sperm retention, right? That's not mm. the same as parthenogenesis. So, so there are animals in the world that are able to reproduce completely asexually. They need no contact with the other sex. In fact, their their sex is in question itself if they're a parthenogenic creature, right? So they their cells divide. Um, they they can create offspring. They're basically making clones of themselves. There's quite a lot of lizard species that do this. That is not the case in ball pythons, at least not as far as we know. What is the case is that those animals have the ability to retain sperm within their system. The same as fern, the tortoise that we caught in the Galapagos. Yep. Right. She, she, you know, likely has encountered a male mate at some point in her life. Those animals are able to store that sperm within their body um, for up to 20 years sometimes. And the reason being that if they're under environmental stress or they're under a condition in which they do not have enough biological energy to create offspring because they need that energy for fat storage, for water collection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're not going to put that energy into reproduction. So what I'm guessing happened with this ball python is it mated with a male at some point in time. Now, just like everything in life, there's anomalies, right? It, it held on to the sperm way longer. We're talking about what, 60, 70 years? What do we say? 70 now, year old okay, python. So, so 70 years I think old somewhere 70 year old. Right, but she had had contact with a male, I guess, 15 years before the eggs. 15. Oh, so right. 15 yeah. years ago, it's mm -hmm. not even that long, right? So, I mean, that's a long time. Like, we couldn't do it, right? Like, thank God, because you're not finding out girlfriends <laughs> well, from 15, from middle school are uh, pumping well, out kids right now that are yours. Uh, <laughs> well, that that's interesting because there's a, a very famous story, and it, this was all real. This is legit because it was a very big public lawsuit yeah. that happened. There, there was a famous mm. tennis player in the uh, 90s named Boris Becker. You guys remember him? Oh, yeah. I remember kinda, Boris Becker. Forrest, you kind of look like Boris Becker. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will, so, can you pull up a picture of Boris Becker? Let's get this going here. You kind of look like him. Not. Both handsome men. Uh, so, <laughs> bo look, Boris Becker was really famous, right? He was, he was huge. He was in England, and yep. he went uh, to a nightclub and uh, made the decision to go into the bathroom stall with a female model, a British Bro. model, who proceeded to perform fellatio on him. Okay. Mm -hmm. He finished. She <laughs> then... Uh, that's old Boris Becker. Young Boris <laughs> Becker. Yeah, come on, Will. That's fucked up. <laughs> nah, nah, it looks just like you, even in the old version. <laughs> give, me, give me handsome 90s Boris Becker. <laughs> so... He finishes up. Uh, he leaves the stall. In the bathroom. Yeah, okay. he's felatiated. He leaves the stall, and uh, she had some uh, of of his his sperm in, in her mouth, and she took it and inserted it into herself manually with her fingers. Oh God! Got, what? Got pregnant? <sighs> no way! This is a true story. Not only true, you can find articles about it. I've read about it because someone told me this, and I was like, "That's bullshit." <laughs> she admitted all, all this. And so it was this, uh, actually a landmark uh, court case in England because they were trying to figure out the legality because she admitted that this is how the, the child was conceived, whether or not paternity was established because she obviously wanted child support and he was extremely rich. Um, right. So, so, you know, reptiles aren't the only animals that can uh, retain sperm. Right. You just got to keep it in your mouth. So for all of our right. female... <laughs> Grossers, <laughs> just, you know, just hang on to it into your mouth. And yeah, uh, yeah. The odds, the the odds of that working are fucking infinitesimal. I mean, <laughs> she probably didn't even think it was going to work. She was probably just hammered and coked to the gills and like, Ooh, okay, uh, this would be fun. There's I no mean, way she just tried that without the assumption it was going to work. She wasn't just like, I'm just going to give this a whirl. We talk like, about girls do that happened. all the time. Wait, ladies, weigh in. I mean, everybody's sticking <laughs> sperm up their butts and chacholas. Jeez. All right. Uh, all right. This is getting off track. All right. I got something that came across my desk uh, that drink. I really... God damn it. That I really like. Um, Are we drinking because he said came across my desk or because he botched the word desk and said dex? <laughs> Did I say dex? Take two across your decks. Whatever. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, what do you got? All right. So. What do you got, boy? Oh, yeah. It was recently Steve Irwin's birthday. Do you guys know that? It was about probably a I week didn't. ago now. Yeah. Big hero of mine. Everybody knows that. I mean, he's an incredible man. Brought wildlife into the homes of millions and caring and understanding. So when I heard about this, it made me love him even more. Mm. Uh, <laughs> no bro. So into the. No, yeah, no. I mean, whatever. I've, I've, I've got a broner for the guy. What of it? Yeah, um, broner. In 2003, Steve Irwin was filming 
um, in Baja, which I love. I go to Baja all the time, and he was doing work with sea lions. Um, in the middle of a shoot, in the middle of his day, and I love this because it's totally the same kind of thing we would do if this ever happened. Middle of his shoot day, they got word that there were two scuba divers missing in the area, right? So they abandoned the shoot. They grabbed, they jumped in their boats, and they started patrolling up and down the coast looking for these missing divers. Well, sure enough, um, like three or four hours in, they actually found, um, they found the kayak flipped over and up on the rocks was this one, one of the divers and they rescued him and it was like, you know, it was big, big to do. And they were super stoked. Sadly, the other diver was deceased and they found his body later. But how cool is it that Steve Irwin was like, nope, you know, got I might, uh, why don't you cut the cameras? We're going to go find these blokes and just, you know, just packed up and, uh, cruised around and saved, saved one of the two divers who I, I've been in Baja a lot. It is brutally hot. I mean, with no fresh water down there, you are definitely going to pass away. So in my mind, no matter how you cut it, Steve Irwin saved the life of one of those guys, which is pretty incredible. Do you not think the Kardashians would have done the same if they were on their show? <laughs> oh, no, I know they would have. They're good people. Steve Irwin They're is good. a notoriously like good dude, though, isn't he? I mean, he's known for being one of the nicest guys oh, yeah. in, in the industry, basically. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know he's dead, right, Peter? No, I understand that. I'm just saying you should yeah. uh, strive to be a little bit more like him because you're a jerk. That's um, So there is a thing we were doing uh, when we were filming season three of Whale Wars, um, a, an SOS beacon went off on a sailing yacht uh, with three Norwegian uh, adventurers who were trying to recreate some Antarctic expedition. Okay. And so they went in a steel-hulled sailing yacht to Antarctica, their emergency beacon went off. It went to New Zealand's uh, search and rescue. And the boat, the ship, the whale warship called the Steve Irwin because he donated the ship to the Sea Shepherds, mm -hmm. uh, was the closest ship. So th there was actually, obviously there was, I don't think much of a moral decision. You're in the middle of Antarctica. You just, you go right. and you try what, and what find are, them. What That's, else are you going to do? Isn't that but like also maritime there, law? Like you're, you have to basically right. do that. It was also a legal, it's a legal obligation. Right. If you are the closest vessel to a, dis, a distressed vessel, you have to go and search. So uh, I was not on the ship, obviously, but they, they did go. Um, they found the empty life raft flip upside down. Oh. It was the best episode we ever did because it was just this heart-wrenching, beautiful story. Um, but, you know, it's, I believe there is some maritime law involved with that too. I'm not saying Steve, they wouldn't have done it anyway. Of course they would. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, I think human, it's funny because we were just talking about how humans torture, like torture other humans and shit. But at the same time, you have this capacity for this empathy of, of, of going above and beyond and essentially making a bunch of fucking work for yourself to go out and help others too. You know, I talk about how totally. I hate humans, but you know, we have both ends of the, of the spectrum going on at least. Hey, Forrest, so, here's a question from one of the one of the Brosners. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there. No, you're uh, good. but but I'm actually curious. So Harry Starling asks, Forrest, what is the craziest animal that lives in the UK? Um, oh my god! And we've never filmed an ep We've never filmed together in mainland Europe. So I I'm actually curious. I don't. It's not known for its wildlife. So believe it or not, there are some awesome creatures in the United Kingdom. Um, one of my favorites that I've had the luxury of catching a couple times, literally in places you wouldn't expect, like downtown London, are um, there, there are small venomous vipers there. But hands down, in my opinion, the coolest animal in the United Kingdom, an animal that I am desperate to work with, desperate to see, I mean, near the <laughs> top of my bucket list, is um, the basking shark. And so uh. if you look... It, Will, can you pull up a picture of a basking shark in um, in the in the UK and Scotland in particular? And, and Will, he's he's saying basking, not basking. It's with an A, uh, not a oh U H. Oh God, that finger! <laughs> that was not the man. point of that, but yeah. Um, but anyway, look, um, off the coast of Scotland, every year the basking sharks show up. Uh, they congregate to feed on plankton there. They're huge, you know, second largest shark in the world after the whale shark. Mm. Incredible filter feeders, um, and it's it's one of the only places on Earth that they're predictable that you can go and see them. I mean, oh, look at that wow. animal. Holy one crap. one of the coolest creatures on earth. So that's um, the basking shark that Will just pulled up there on the bottom. Look at that mouth. That thing is fucking oh, it's just, wild. It's incredible. I mean, I think it's one of the coolest animals on the planet, and the UK is one of the only places that they're super predictable. So um, to, uh, to Harry Starling, if you get a chance, if you want to do something remarkable, something I've never done that, that's top of my bucket list, 
go up to Scotland, go and snorkel with a basking shark. It's it. I mean, look at it. Look at it. Well, how are these things? How do these uh, basking sharks behave? I mean, their mouths just you said they're like filter feeders. So is that all they eat is just plankton? They're obviously not. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, their mouth just literally looks like a fucking big air filter. It's fucking <laughs> so they swim wild. Through the water with their mouths open like that, um, you know, propelling themselves with their tail, and then they're filtering yeah. water through their gill rakers right. and collecting plankton. I mean, they're basically, you know, it's like the hybrid of a whale and a shark. All the plankton eating sharks. All and sure Cameron, are Cameron like Rogers that. just aptly pointed out that that's what Peter looks like at Taco Bell. By the way, I, ooh, thank you, Cameron. Ooh, ooh, I was thinking zing. the exact same thing when I walk into Taco Bell. I hop over the counter and just engage that mode in my mouth, you know, because at Taco Bell, all the items, it doesn't matter what configuration you got. You got beef, you got cheese, tortilla and lettuce. Who cares what order they're in, dude? Just suck it in, dude. Let do. it go right you down. Do. Because you keep going there and ordering different things. Like I don't care what order they're in. No, no. They're, by the way, I, I got to plug our sponsor, Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they got a we great wish. new deal ten dollar box you can get four burritos and four hard tacos for ten bucks they're not a sponsor shut up well, why are you doing this <laughs> <laughs> so two days ago right I, I think i told you guys i was coming out of the bush in oregon um hitting the road and my phone starts blowing up right this is a true story it's it's actually i'm pretty proud of it my phone starts blowing up right ping 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 and i'm like what the fuck's going on and I start getting all of these Instagram messages about a tiger that's escaped. Have you guys seen this? No. No, not Knoxville, yet. Knoxville, mm-hmm. Tennessee. Um, someone has spotted, not someone, multiple people have spotted a wild tiger roaming around Knoxville, rural Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, that's crazy. That, you know, it's likely the escape from a Joe Exotic kind of right. thing. But <laughs> right. This is where the story gets more fun. So I start getting all these messages. I'm like, yeah, cool, got it, saw it, whatever, ignoring them, deleting them, whatever. And then sure enough, Guess who calls me? Joe not calls Exotic. me, messages me. Who? Wildlife Control from Tennessee Holy says, shit. Hey, Forrest Galante, do you have any insight on tracking tigers? No. In the United States? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. I was like, how many people suggested that I be the guy that go and get the tiger in Knoxville? That's Obviously amazing. enough that Wildlife Control reached out. And uh, I literally wrote back, I'm like, Look, I mean, I can help you track tigers, but I've certainly never looked for one in Tennessee before. <laughs> um, well, and they're like, you know, I, I sent them some resources and some links, but I could not believe that enough people, enough of you brosners or fans or whomever told the Knoxville Wildlife Control or Police Department to reach out <laughs> to me that they actually sent me a message on through my website. They sent me an email asking how to track a tiger in Knoxville. And I was like, this is super cool. Um, by the way, did you, well, cause so I was just sort of fantasizing about just us going to try and trap this tiger. What would you do? But I mean, obviously you'd leave out me, what the fuck do you do to, to find a tiger that's in a you know, meat tree, dude, like in urban Zanzibar. area. Yeah. Meat yeah. Tree. I mean, build a meat I, building, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that I do. I think that we could track it. Yes, absolutely. I think that you'd bait it the way that they used to bait tigers. I think you could use tiger calls. This is likely a lonely animal. I'm sure it's, there's not a bunch of them running around. Um, I think that some of our thermal technology could be very effective. Um, yeah. and yeah. And I think, you know, do I think that we could find it? Totally. Um, the information on the tiger is spotty, right? It's, it's basically the fact that, a handful of people have spotted it and nothing else. One of these things happened once before and, and to the guy's credit in, in India, he's a freaking genius. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I think uh, there was a guy in yeah. India who had like a German shepherd and he painted it like a tiger and it was running around <laughs> the streets of like Bangladesh. And it, it, I mean, it's like, Will, can you find this please? This, the German shepherd or whatever big dog painted like a tiger in India. And it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, this, this, this dog is running around like, terrifying people in like Bangladesh and then <laughs> someone catches it and they're like, Oh, it's a guy's German shepherd. Well, Bangladesh <laughs> actually so funny. Bangladesh actually has tigers though. Right. Like that. Or I, I actually don't know if it was India. I don't remember where it was, but oh, I just remember oh. it was just insanely hilarious. Either um, way. I mean, th- that's, so, that's a nightmare. Imagine you see, but like a German shepherd, I feel like looks so much different. He must've done a real good paint job on that thing. If Will finds it, you, your, your mind will be blown. Pat, do you think you could uh, you can mark up uh, your little pup, your little German Shepherd that way? 
Oh my god! There, look at that's that. Ri- <laughs> that's ridiculous. It looks like a fucking kangaroo tiger. Yeah, that's <laughs> clearly a thyl- thylacine sighting right there, dude. That looks like some type of undiscovered animal more what a, than a tiger. What a loon! <laughs> What a, what a loon for doing that. By the way, the I think effort it's that, so good. The effort that went into those stripes, I mean, those stripes are legit. That those are like legit tiger oh, stripes. Yeah. But its oh, yeah. face just looks so much not like a cat <laughs> that, that anybody hey, thought I, that was I, a real tiger. I like this question Dude. from uh Scott Padway. Oh, says, since Baco. you're talking cats. No way. Scott Padway is an old rugby buddy from UC Santa Barbara. What's up, Bacon? Bacon. Welcome. Yeah. What, why why do you call him Bacon? You're, you'll have to ask him to share that story. Uh, Scott is <laughs> All right. going to. All right, uh, Bacon. Because he's a fucking so anyway, pig. Sorry. By the way, this would be hilarious if this wasn't the same Scott Padway, if this True. was a different one. But he says, True. since you're talking cats, uh, Forrest, you've been on Naked and Afraid. You showed off that tiny Hogan of yours. Mm. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Teeny Hogan. So he says, if you and some bros got dropped off in the uh, Serengeti, naked and afraid style, how long before you get eaten? I know mm. nothing of the Serengeti. I've never been there. Is this like a fucking lion? This is That's where all the lions hang out, right? If us three were dropped into the Serengeti during the migration when all the lions are tracking the wildebeest and zebra... Said zebra, not zebra. Um, People, just finish whatever drink you have, everyone listening. <laughs> he said zebra. That's the holy grail. <laughs> Rule number 12. Damn it. I walked myself into that corner. Um, Out of space zebras. We, we would not last long. <laughs> Look, I'll be honest. Like I like to think that of, of everybody I know, I, I'm pretty skilled in surviving in these wilderness. And here's the thing. I, let, let's back up and talk big picture for a second here. You watch Naked Afraid, right? Some guys who I won't name, they thump their chest and they go out there and they're like, I'm going to conquer nature. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the toughest. I'm the best. You're fucking nothing, guy. Listen, if you think you're going to conquer, I'm, I'm calling you out right here, guys whose name I won't say who I know. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm calling you out because you cannot well, listeners, conquer weigh nature. In. Who do you think it is? Nature will conquer you. And if you think that because you've been on Naked Afraid or some survival show in some semi-controlled environment, and there's lions outside of a fence somewhere that you're tough as shit, you're not, okay? Mm. Because when you go walking in the bush in Africa, if you don't make every single step correctly, and quite simply put, if you don't have a firearm on you, you are going to be killed. Like, there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. Like, you, you know, unless, and that's why you see African, you know, African in tribes, right? They hang out in big groups. They don't go walking by themselves. It's because sure. you will absolutely be killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no question about that. Now, I'm not saying that, is, you know, if you go walking through Cape Town in South Africa, obviously that's that's not accurate. But if you go walking through the bush where there are high densities of predators in Southern Africa, unlike anywhere else in the world, you will not make it. Yeah. Hey, so when you did Naked and Afraid for us, were there any fences or boundaries up? Uh, there were boundaries put up by the producers. So there were no fences. There was nothing like that. Panama is not dangerous like Africa, right? Sure. So I know... I know that when they do it in Africa, they must do it in a place with no big predators. They, I, they I know producers on the show, and and they do. There's a perimeter. Yeah. And so it really pissed me off when I saw uh, – by the way, I'm probably going to get sued here. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, they, they portray it as if lions are out there at night roaring yeah. oh, 30 yeah. feet away from the people. I'm like, no one believe like, you can't believe that that's true. They're Don't outside the fucking crazy. perimeter. Yeah, I mean, dude, you'd no be way. dead in set in minutes, right? For a one hundred percent, and that's I've I've watched some of those like all star shows and stuff where they're in Africa and they're like, there's lions right around the corner. I can hear them roaring. Yeah, you can hear them roaring at the game park next to where you're, um, you know, hanging <laughs> right. out with the thirteen foot electrical fence. Um, but there are no big predators. They just simply wouldn't allow that. They just won't do that. Like, there's absolutely, you know, like no. Patrick, you're a producer. Are you gonna let you gonna let a bunch of nitwits from America? camp in the African bush where there's actually lions? Well, the thing is, I don't like jail very much. I spent one night there when I was in high school and I hated it. (laughs) Mm. So no. Um, But yeah, so when I was on, sorry, when I was on Naked and Afraid, um, they put up like non-physical barriers, but they're like, look, you can only go five miles in that direction and five miles in that direction because otherwise, you know, you're basically going to self-rescue. Like you'll find a road or a village or something and then, and then the show's over (laughs) and So they'd kind of like, you know, the camera guys and stuff would be like, hey, it's probably a good time to turn around. I'd be like, hey, it's probably not. Um, right. Well, so they kind of they keep you in an area, but like you found the jungle potatoes too. So they're also, 
They also want you to fucking not find a good source of food and not escape and not get eaten by cats. Well, they just, how many they jungle just know potatoes did you eat? I mean, cause you gained what? 70, so 80 pounds. <laughs> yep. 70, 80. That's the right number. <laughs> I'm fascinated. You gained 40 pounds in Taco Bell weight before you went out there. And then another 30 from just jungle potatoes. Yep. Um, that's, that's correct. 70. So pounds. And that, that like brings me to it on camera. That brings me to a question. One of the, the brosners wants to know, Forrest, why did you decide to dance at the beginning of your Naked and Afraid episode? What was, <laughs> you, what was that about? Have you seen me dance? It's, in, it's majestic. Oh, it God. is good. I'm, I'm glad they you blurred know, your tiny pecker. It's inc- I, I, I was peacocking out there. I'm trying to make an impression, you know? I'm just, With a tiny feather. <laughs> yeah, whatever, dude. I'm trying to keep the eyes up high, all right? <laughs> like, you're, you have the smallest Hogan out in the wild, at that point. So you were trying to, trying to yeah. like, you know, show, show off by dancing. I'd imagine. Yeah. Did you, did yeah. you dance in front of the woman? Have you not seen this? Are you not? I, I can't find it. As one of the Brosners pointed out, I can only find like short clips on YouTube. I've never, I, seen I've never episode. seen it for us. I've All right. never seen well, it. Well, well, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to play it here. Cause it's like three minutes long, but, um, we are going to post a link to me. So just so you guys know, I did the party boy dance. I, I, so every the way naked and afraid. Yeah, I didn't know you didn't know this, Peter. And, and yeah. for the Brosners out there, so I did naked and afraid um, a while ago, long before we did Extinct or Alive. It was a fun little foyer into survival television. And uh, what happens is on Naked and Afraid, two people get put together for the first time ever, and it's super awkward. And they usually do like a weird high five or a butt out hug, and they're like, "Hi, I'm naked," <laughs> and I'm like, "All right, it's cold out here. Here. I'm, it's cold. I'm sorry, I'm so small." Um, <laughs> And, uh, and that I was voice. like, you know what? Fuck this noise. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be out there all awkward. I'm just gonna like break the ice straight off the bat. Like, let's get a, let's get a good couple yucks in early, establish a good relationship. Well, that <laughs> didn't happen. But, um, what did happen is I came out of the gate swinging, literally swinging. Um, and I just, you know, I jumped out of the boat, saw her walking down the beach and I was just like, <laughs> right up to her. And it was, uh. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I won't say it was embarrassing cause I'm not embarrassed by it, but it was a, it was a power play. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I had wanna, a, uh, what was her response sorry, to, to just your, your tiny brogan flopping around out there? Uh, she was mortified. She felt, she, she felt very awkward. Yeah. She <laughs> felt very awkward. I gotta see yeah. this. Is this on tape? Like they, they it edited is. it that w- way? Will's going to send it. Will's going to send okay. it. You're going to watch it. It's like, there's like a naked introduction. It's like super awkward. Uh, look, I think it was hilarious. My Hogan is a normal enough size that I was able to pull it off. Um, you know, I was like the hippo's sure. tail out there. I was just windmilling my way over to her and it was <laughs> nice. a hell of a move. <laughs> Doing the hippo tail. I had a buddy. Hippo. I used to live in this house with a bunch of stand up comics. And, uh, one of them was just such a fucking ne'er do well. Uh, he never was working and he was like, dude, I, uh, I got cast to be on that show next mm. on MTV. <laughs> They're going to give me 200 bucks. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember this show. It was like a dating oh, game yeah. show where Gra- 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 we're on a next. bus. Graver did next. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. I got to find that. But it's so he's like third to go. My, my buddy. So we're all sitting down to watch his episode and, uh, they cut to it's his turn. They cut to his little sound bite that he says on the bus. He goes, I'm going to show this girl my ma'am meat. Uh, and then he just start the, the bus doors open, the girl's standing there and he takes one step and she just goes nah, next. <laughs> <laughs> it was the fastest next in the history of the show. It was just fantastic. It was a great like show. That. It was a great show. Yeah, Gra- Graber went on. So anybody that hasn't listened, we had my buddy, Alex Graber, who's the president of our fraternity in college. He's, he's a real douche, but in the best, most lovable way on the podcast and he he goes on the show and he gets on the bus and he goes on on a date with this chick and uh he makes it all the way to the end and and uh he's like you know do you want to go on another date with me or however it goes and she's like nope and so they cut to him at the end and he goes well you they they ate a hot dog on the date that was the day it's going to like a hot dog cast and he goes well you missed out on the biggest hot dog of all (laughs) <laughs> and, that's all does. <laughs> and that's the end that's, of the show. That sounds like him. It really it's does. It's pretty good. It's good old funny. Alex Graber. Yeah, what a so, Ritep, are we thinking uh, moving forward, starting soon, we're going to be doing the live podcast in addition to one regular podcast each week? 
Yeah. I mean, I'd love to do that. You guys are the ones that are tough to rein in, but I, I would absolutely, I, I would love to, to do that. So if, if you guys are down, I'm down. Yeah. I mean, it's, dude, this is fun, man. Just hanging out with a handful of the Brosners, chatting it up. This is, this is what we wanted to do is just make it a, a community and, and get to hang out with some people that like to talk about the same stupid shit and science that's yeah. important that we do. It's, uh, it's good to hear. Yeah. It, I really like hearing from a lot of the people that comment that come on on Instagram and now they're in the chat and I recognize the names. So appreciate, appreciate everybody coming over to YouTube and doing the live chat. Cause this definitely makes the recording a lot more fun. Yeah. It's a good time. Yeah. Yeah. We should do, we should do one of each, I think moving forward. And then obviously we've got, we're going to have some huge announcements potentially in the next month. We're uh, working on something quite major for us. We can't get Seriously too into major. it, but yep. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot happening. Yeah, buddy. Harry Starling lost track of time. It's 3 a.m. where he, he is. We got a lot of fucking It's time to have another listeners. drink, Harry. Yeah, Harry, yeah, pour on, it up. Harry. I got a full glass of fucking Cabronat. Let's so go for us, for the hell of it. Wait, Taco Bell, Taco uh, Bell, take two drinks. Forrest, uh, Christina was saying to me tonight, um, I was like, yep, yeah, earlier, actually, I was saying Peter might come over to do the podcast here. And she goes, oh, great. So you're not going to wake up till like four or five tomorrow. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> she goes, he, he doesn't let anyone sleep. If Peter comes over, you're not going to sleep. So Harry, 3 a.m., that's, that's when Peter's waking up for the day most of the time. That's, that's true. not true. I, 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 that, that's the old Peter. I've only been over there once where that's happened. And by the way, I love how in relationships, it's always deflected to the friend. How did you twist her mind? For her to think that I'm the fucking cause of you staying up till fucking five in the morning, as if it's not a joint effort. I mean, you stay up. You texted me at like 4 a.m. the other night. Mate, Forrest has sl- spent the night here 20 fucking times, and I go mm-hmm. to bed at three or four. Every okay. time you come over, I'm up till seven or eight. You do stay up Listen. all night, Peter. This is true. This is not true. It's nonsense. I haven't done that in years. I prefer to get out of any place I'm at before Taco Bell closes so I can hit it on the way home. Fact. Wait, you know what? what? I, I, <laughs> I got to ask you a question, Peter. Sure. Um, Brosner James, who's just been just pinging us over here, is asking a question that we talked about on our Saturday, uh, Saturday drink not record session. Mm-hmm. What's going on with the merch? Are we still making merch? Yeah, the happening? merch, Ooh. the merch is in the works. We've got, well, I sent you guys the design. We have some cool shit. Uh, the spirit animal designs. I sent you the blobfish. We're working on the amygdala one. Uh, we had to re- redo that one. Uh, but everything, I know I promised or said this week, but uh, next week now. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's coming. It's coming and it's in the works. And I'm back and forth with the designer, sending the shit to the, these guys. And we'll have it out for you soon. Promise. I gotta say, for for all you Brosners that are tuning into this, it's this has been really fun. Like when we started this, and just you know, here's a little behind the scenes. When we started this, it was just the three of us. We were sitting right here in my in my office, and we we're just like, you know what? We're we're just gonna hang out and record some shit and just have a conversation. How long do we record for that first night, Peter? Seven hours that you had to whittle down yes. to an hour. Uh, yeah, t- t- seven hours, three minutes. Yes. <laughs> For 43 minutes and it yeah. was just us hanging out and we're like you know what let's just put it out like it's just us having fun like we're all buddies we love hanging out we love chatting mm-hmm. and we hope that you know you guys will hang out with us you you brosners and be a part of this and it's um it's awesome like we're yeah. we're 24 episodes in 23 yep. episodes 20, in whatever it is and 20, everybody's hanging weeks. out 24 yeah, weeks i mean this is amazing Tap a year. i'm having so much fun with this it's crazy it's such a good thing to just hang out with you guys and all you brosners and get the questions and chat and see the engagement online so yeah thanks everybody that's my thing yeah for sure i mean i i it, the the whole the whole part of this that i didn't really comprehend would be so much fun is is that interaction that we're getting like everywhere on instagram here now i love this live shit and uh i do think i i don't think that pat's a great guy the the producer he just yeah. gets up in the middle of a podcast and goes somewhere it's it's kind of bananas let's look what what is that his house he's got high ceilings doesn't he <laughs> 
all it's all judge. There's nothing um, to make fun of there, which annoys me. Oh, look, hey, so who decided I, I to had come to back. piss so bad. I'm sorry. Okay. So Elliot Elliot Miller just asked a pretty important question, or it was yes. a statement. He just says, "Give us cameraman Mitch." Elliot, you got it. We'll get Mitch on the pod. Yes. End of discussion. Yep. Um, That's it. Hey, by the way, everyone who's listening now in the live stream, throw us some ideas for the fucking uh, Battle Royale. Hell some yeah. Some ideas for Battle Royale. Forrest, here's an actual question I'm interested in coming from Daniel Shoot. Daniel Cool. Forrest, do you publish your extinct animal findings and how does academia, t- academia take it? Like, I mean, oh, it's a great question. That was from, sorry, who is that from? Uh, Daniel Cool. Big fan. What's up, Daniel? Yeah. What's up, Daniel? Um, yeah, so at, and first we started to. We wrote a paper on um, the civet that we found in, in Zanzibar, and then we began writing the paper on the leopard find. And we were going down um, we were going down the route of publishing. But, you know, the thing is, for all of you people that are tuning into this, all you brosners that watch this, watch Extinct Real Live, there's way more impact just doing the show. And Patrick and I are so busy with um, producing the television and the research and the effort that it goes into it that we actually haven't continued to publish papers um, because really nothing comes of it. You know, I like to explain to people that we are, we're, we're the hired guns, right? We're the hide and seek champs that you call in to do the job and then we leave. I'm not the person that's going to manage the ongoing conservation of a species in Ecuador, in Colombia, in any of these countries, right? That's up to the local scientists who are fantastic people that just needed a little bit of help and we're that little bit of help. So we're the hide and seek champs. We're the mercenaries that come in and do the job and then bail and turn over all of the information that we have to the in-country scientists. And that's what we've done time and time again. We go in, we find everything, and then we actually turn that information over to the people that can manage the ongoing conservation of the species. And some of them have published papers. So the Galapagos find papers have been published. Uh, the sharks that we found on the Shark Week show, all, uh, two of the three have papers coming out uh, before the end of this year. So a ton nice. of a ton, yeah, a ton of um, a ton of of papers are being published on the findings, just not by us. And because you know, why would we? We're not. We we are the sci- We are the scientists that find it, but we're not the ones going to manage the ongoing conservation. We don't understand all the laws, traditions, and customs that um, all need to take place around, uh, you know, around the species. So, yeah. There's it's cool, though, because <laughs> what you, you got you guys, your guys' role, I feel like, from the layman like me, is you bring attention to it to begin with. I mean, in an entertaining way, which is like, I would have never known about half the fucking animals or anything. Like the Galapagos, you know, fern, for example, is a super... Not only was it like super impactful in the science community, it was very entertaining to watch, you know what I mean? Well, and not, and not just bring attention to it. And that's one thing that, you know, we never really show on the show that I think is so significant. And one of the things I'm so proud of is we bring a ton of financing to it. Um, you know, a lot of these places don't have the economical means by which to conduct the searches and surveys and findings that we're putting into it. So when Mm -hmm. we come in there, you know, we're able to finance these expeditions. We're able to bring people with us. We're able to have local scientists contribute or come with or hand over that research. So it allows us a vessel to bring finance dollars to conservation for animals that otherwise, not only is there no money, but they're otherwise believed to not even be there. So it's, you know, this is like a huge ordeal because nobody else, you know, nobody else is doing this. Not, not the in-country scientists, not people from the United States, not anybody, because why would they? These are animals deemed or believed to be extinct. They have no reason to go search for them. If you're a primate expert in Borneo, you're probably not going to be working on the presumed extinct Miller's grizzled langur. You're going to be working on orangutans, which are facing, you know, critic, they're, they're reaching a point of critical collapse. So why not, you know, what we do is, is fun, don't get me wrong, but we're, we're throwing the Hail Mary every time to look for these animals. So yeah, you know, it's different. It's, it's very outside the box. It's a different type of approach. And we never knew we were going to be successful eight times over. Right, Patrick? I mean, we were like, yeah, maybe we'll find one one day if we're lucky. And here we are eight times later. So, um, it's, well, it's uh, to me, it's the other thing is like, I don't, you know, Forrest obviously is coming from a different background than I am, but you know, trying to prove to the gatekeepers of information who are generally making selfish decisions the way many humans do is, is not that interesting to me. It's like, I'd rather, we filmed it, we put it out there. The people yep. that are really, really in that academic world, you know, it's, it's up to them to take the ball and move it forward. And I, it really, for me, right. Forrest, it was after we were in Madagascar the first time 
with Harvard PhD, Courtney Bargerson, who had been living mm -hmm. in a remote village in Madagascar and uh, taken photographs, witnessed, described, spent seven or 10 years, I can't remember, um, describing a new lemur species. And because she didn't have a vial of DNA, because she right. didn't have the means or I think capability of capturing one, um, and she couldn't get, she tried for years to get someone else out to witness this new lemur. She couldn't get an academic paper published. And this is a Harvard PhD. And she, right. nobody wanted to go there because it's so right. goddamn far. It's so brutal. You're going to shit yourself so 17 remote. fucking times. <laughs> and she couldn't get anyone else to go. And so this lemur species is still technically undescribed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, I, am I wrong about that, Forrest? No, you, you more. Yeah, no, that's correct. That's correct. In, in essence, it's all correct. Um, and that's the thing is it's, there's a lot of barriers in science, especially in financing. And we're very fortunate to have the backing of, you know, discovery communications to, to finance us to go and do this work and hand over the science. And it's in no situation has it been anything but a win-win for the species, uh, you know, and us, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's <laughs> weird when people, uh, what? Sorry, what do you go, got? Go ahead. Someone posted no. a great battle royale. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, let's get into it. Are you guys ready to do the battle royale? Or are you guys any, uh, more, I don't, any more news? Uh, this is pretty good. It's pretty specific, but I feel like we'll laugh a lot if we do this one. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it. Forrest, what time is it? Battle royale. Wow, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just, I, a bunch of people posted really good ones. Uh, I like this one from our, our friend in uh, Great Britain who said, uh, pick two celebrities to fight till death. But uh, that's not the one that made me laugh as much. <laughs> Harry Starling, Harry's, Harry Starling says, have a bird battle. Three Ooh. birds. <laughs> Everyone picks three birds oh, that have to fight the other person's three birds. <laughs> Oh my God. It's a bird battle. I think okay. it's pretty funny. I think we Let's should do, do it. it. Bird okay. battle. Uh, snake draft, I think, right? Sure. Makes sense. Makes now, here's uh, what do we, do we want to do, Forrest? I'm going to let you decide this. Do we go with uh, extant species or bird species that have ever lived? Mm, let's just hey. go with, with common birds. Okay. <laughs> Living birds. Okay. Peter goes pigeon, chicken, and other chicken. All right. Listen. Snake draft, the battle royale, Let bird battle. Uh, I'm going to go first since I picked it and because there's an nice. obvious way to win. Yep. I'm going to take the motherfucking cassowary. I knew you were going to take the cassowary, you piece of shit. That's why you wanted to go first. I'm a bad you're person. The, you're the worst. You are. I'm you a really terrible are. person. Bird Speaking person. of snake uh, drafts, you're a snake. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take the cassowary. We had a run-in with a cassowary in Australia. Uh, Peter, you're breathing into the microphone awfully loud. I, I did it on um, purpose. I was making a snake noise, you fucking snake gun. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, the cassowary is a terrifying bird. Uh, Forrest, give us a little info on the cassowary. Yeah, so the cassowary is an ancient-ish species of bird. It occurs in Australia and Papua New Guinea. They have an incredible hard helmet that goes over the top of their head. Um, but what they're most notable for is they're really the only bird that is known to like violently attack and disembowel people using their giant talons um, on their legs. They're, imagine a smaller ostrich. It's blue. It's got some red in it. It's black. Super aggressive, especially if they have, um, especially if they have babies. How about Very those feet, baby? How about those feet? Ooh, yeah, there you go. Oh, those Let's feet. Get, those are human-sized feet. Will, producer Will just oh, no, brought they're up a much, picture of this. Much bigger than human-sized feet. Much bigger. <laughs> That's yeah. a nightmare. Those claws, those talons. Ugh, See the pat. big helmet they, on them? They pat. occasionally will kill a human, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, there, there's been a couple reported accounts. In fact, the last one, I believe, was in Florida, of all places. I think it might have been at the place Chris Gillette works. I'm not positive on that, though. Holy um, shit. Sure. And, yeah, an older keeper... Was uh was going in with his cassowary, and sure enough, it it gutted him. Ugh. God damn, mate! All right, well, that's my first Good pick, Forrest. You're right in the middle. We'll put you next to give Peter more time to do research because he doesn't know about birds at all. <laughs> I mean, you picked a cassowary, mate. You know, we talked about it several times on the podcast. You've encountered one in the wild. Listen, 
I have many problems with your fucking pick, but I'm going to wait till my turn this time to make fun of your picks. Okay. Of course, what kind of bird are you going to go with? I'm going to go with Golden Eagle. Um, You know, it's, it's, it might be kind of generic, but the Golden Eagle is unbelievable. You know, they're, they have a up to eight foot wingspan, uh, the ability to hunt coyotes and deer, huge talons, massive amount of force. Um, as far as an aerial salt goes, I'll take golden eagle over a harpy eagle, um, you know, pretty much over a sea eagle, over any of the other big eagles. I think the golden eagle has the ferociousness and velocity to take on any of the other big eagles. So, yeah, going to start with golden eagle. So that's going to bomb down from the sky and just kill my cassowary with one peck. <clears throat> Not peck. It's going to go talons to the throat. I mean, these things, there are videos of golden eagles literally picking up coyotes. I mean, they are amazing predators and they've got these huge, you know, knives for talons on, um, on the end of their feet. So that's, that's going to, that's going to dive bomb. It's going to go for that cassowary. going to go straight for the throat. Just a real, real monster. All right, okay. Pater. All what right. you got? Well, um, I mean, since your bird, Pat, <clears throat> will not God be able damn, to... look at that golden eagle. Yeah. Isn't that great? I mean, already you, you, your, your pick is ridiculous because you're fighting other birds and other birds fly and you picked a bird that does not fly. So, I mean, your, your stupid fucking castaway will not <laughs> be able to do anything. First of all, against his golden eagle that will just be storming from above, destroying the shit out of your castaway. Um, Cassowary. Cassowary, I'm tipsy. Uh, that said, <clears throat> I'm going to pick an animal that is a common bird that everybody knows is a vicious fucking... The talons on this thing are fucking just fierce. And it flies, which is fantastic. I'm going to go with just a common hawk, a red-tailed hawk that will come from above. They're large. Why? They're fucking, that, they can be trained. Hawk, you know? Because it can be trained. It, and it's large. It, It'll be it'll be killed in a second by your cassowary. That will what, what's it going to do? Jump when my fucking bird just keeps attacking from above. Do you know can how we, America won World War II? Can we address that for a moment. How, how the how the Allies won World War II, Pat? It was with airplanes because we attacked from the sky. Your cassowary will be destroyed. That said, I would like to have some ground troops. On my team, I get a second pick, right? Is this how the sneak yes. draft works? Yes, you finally, you finally learned it. Yep. Well done, boy. I will be picking a common ostrich for the ground assault. Oh, you some bitch. That was <laughs> That's right. Bird. So I will have one coming from above, one on the ground. It's, I mean, I've given you a strategy, Pat. You're obviously going to pick a flying bird. I know you were going to try and pick another ground bird because you're an idiot. Uh, that's my team uh, right now. Those are my picks. Good picks. Thanks. For us, any thoughts on what Peter just did to us? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think his red tail hawk is bringing anything to the table. I really don't. It's just, it's it's the Patrick DeLuca of hawks. It's meager. <laughs> 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 it's, <laughs> I mean, it. you know, whatever. Fuck it's off. cool. Red tails are dope. I don't think, I don't think they're adding a lot to the fight, but, you yeah. know, that's good. Sure. That's good. All right. Um, What's your second pick for us? The ostrich, however, is a little scary. They're very big. Formidable. That's definitely, definitely what my second pick was going to be. But you know, I'm going for a, I'm going for a threefold approach. So I've got my aggression <laughs> with the golden eagle. Now I'm going to go for something that Caring. I always think is important. The I'm reason medic. that I am good at rugby, I'm going for speed. I'm Ooh. going with the peregrine falcon. 200 miles per hour is the speed at which the peregrine falcon can dive. You tell me wow. who's slowing that down. That's crazy. Is that the fastest diving bird? I believe so. I'd have to double check. Um, but I'm, I'm sure some of our sure. brosners will Google it and weigh in. Uh, I'm pretty. All right. So what do you have? You have a peregrine falcon and a golden what? eagle. Golden, golden eagle. eagle. All right. Yep. So I've got a cassowary. It's terrifying. It's a real shit show. I mean, good luck dealing with that in the ground fight. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a, t- a tactic because I'm smart and I'm my team is going to be sure. the smart team. Okay. I'm going to have. Not a large bird. I'm going to bring a cuckoo. Okay. Oh, interesting. So what it's going to do, what, is, what sound does a cuckoo make? Cuckoo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You nailed it. Pretty much. Uh, so they're trying to fight these birds or it's mayhem. Flying, kicks, pecks. All this is happening. And in <laughs> the distance, bombs. you hear something going, cuckoo, cuckoo. And everyone goes, what? Cassowary, kick to the head. 
Uh, so my cuckoo is going to be my distraction technique. Oof. And then uh, I'm going to take a page out of the Brosner's book here because just a lot of them want me to pick this bird and I've Googled it and it's probably the most terrifying looking creature on earth. The Andean condor. Oh nah. yeah. They're amazing creatures. Forrest, are you familiar with this creature? I am. <laughs> it is. It looks like a fucking pterodactyl. Uh, its Dude. head is just ridiculous looking. There is a picture of an Andean condor attacking a bull in a bullfighting ring, and the bull looks well, that's cool. just like it's not happy about it. That's my squad. That. That's amazing. That is my Andean squad. Andean condors a real power play. I mean, that is a huge bird. You know, they're not super aggressive, but you're you're talking about a trained <laughs> condor, and yeah, you're you're winning some fights. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, Forrest, what's going to round out your squad? Look at that. Look at that picture. That's an Andean oh condor God. attacking a bull. It's like the size of the bull. <laughs> That's what you're going to look like with, with, the, when you're, with your bird attack. That's pretty impressive. That's a good, that's a good pick. Um, all right, so I've got my golden eagle aggression from the sky. I've got my peregrine falcon speed. It's basically a flying bullet. Mm-hmm. Finally, to round out my team, now you guys aren't going to see this coming, similar strategy to what you took, Patrick. Okay. I'm going to get a gorgeous minor bird. What? Oh, yeah. Sound like a a size of a hummingbird? A minor bird? Minor bird? No. It's a small bird. Okay. Um, It's a small bird. And I'll tell you why. Why? Yeah. Uh, Because minor... uh, Sorry, not minor bird. Well, no, I could go with the minor bird. I was was debating between these two. Um, Because the minor birds build very structurally sound. They're... Well, okay. A couple of reasons. Um, Let's see. Where do I start? (laughs) Um, The minor birds... (sighs) You gonna have a swarm of these? There's just gonna be one. I'm well, just, just uh, relax. Yeah, I, they're incredibly invasive. Relaxed. Okay, Peter, check they're your incredibly in, they're they're incredibly invasive birds. Um, they have the ability. Yeah, there you go. See that cute little minor bird over there? They're incredibly invasive. They've made a muck. They've run a muck all over um, uh, all over the world, and they build very structurally sound nests. So what I'm hoping is the minor bird is just going to come in. I was thinking the weaver bird at first, but I, I think the minor bird is going to come in. It's going to be a complete menace. You can't get rid of it. That's the case with the minor birds all over the world. Then it's just going to build the super structurally sound <laughs> nest, which is basically going to act as a fort for the golden eagle and the peregrine falcon. So Ooh, it's gonna have, they're so going to have defensible. They're going to have some defensible, um, you know, some so territory. you're playing Minecraft. You're kind of doing like yeah. a Minecraft scenario. Yeah, we're here. we're building, no. we're attacking. No, you know, no, we got no, everything no. going on. Mm-mm. No, 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 no. <laughs> you have a fort built of twigs by tiny birds. It's not going to defend against anything. Um, maybe, maybe not. They're very invasive. Can't get rid of them. That's a problem. Try, I mean, try. If I outlast you, I win. You can't get rid of us. I mean, so I have my last pick. My <laughs> last pick is fucking phenomenal. So uh, let me ask you, are you having a team of birds build this nest or is it just one? Do we each get one bird? Can we have multiple? We just it's one, one bird. My understanding is one. So you're going to have one bird build this nest, a fort for everybody? Don't worry, and don't worry about that. Don't worry about me. I got my pick. All right. My pick. This will solidify my win. So everybody will finish their drink at the end of this episode when I win this. I will have a vulture. That's right. I'm going to have the common vulture. They are very accustomed to just destroying meaty, fleshy bodies. So he'll be down. And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at the end of the day because my ostrich and my red-tailed hawk will have simply destroyed all of your birds so that my vulture will have plenty of food to come and eat and procreate. That's cool. You just picked a much, much smaller version of the Andean condor. That's cool. That'll, that'll, <laughs> Correct. That'll be good. Doesn't matter. Be good. Doesn't matter. I'll be good. Don't care. That'll be good. Doesn't matter. Uh, Matt McHugh drink. says, "Good, good pick, Peter." Uh, this has been really, really fun. By the way, uh, what do you, what do you think, Forrest? First real live stream thoughts. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I I I would be curious to know what the Brosners thought. I mean, I noticed our numbers. You know, they got up there to 70 or so, and now they're down to down to 50 or so. So did we bore you people? Let us know. Um, because no, I like not. I like engaging with fans. I yes. like having people. Um, no, I'm, look, it's it's I'm I'm joking. I'm having a great time. Um, I like hammered. having a drink with everybody. I, I'm not. I've had one beer tonight. I'm doing pretty good. 
Um, <laughs> and yeah, I love it. I think we should do more lives. And I'd love to hear from the Brosners if you guys think more lives, this is the way to do it. If you want us to go back to the traditional stuff. Um, and like, like Patrick said, we got something really special that we're working on that hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be back. Uh, we'll be up and running in what, probably a couple of weeks, Patrick. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Definitely within the next month. Um, we're going to, this is our first live one. We're going to get our shit sorted out. Obviously the audio levels and all that shit We're you know, test run. Thanks for hanging. You guys are great. Yep. The engagement's super fun. Uh, yeah, shit. Aaron just Aaron says guys, real fun wish, time. Thumbs up. I wish you guys would tell me what you're talking about. You guys are making plans without me in the Correct. next month. There better be something very special and I better know about we're, it. By we're the figuring end of the night. out how to weed you out of this entirely, Peter. Oh, we well, good luck with that. Good luck. <laughs> I hope you hired <laughs> somebody in your Oh, and Jason, Jason Abs brought up a good question. We didn't do animal of the week. We did Ooh. not. Do you got one? Yeah. You got one ready? Yeah. Uh, we did have okay. one. So Will, the, what do we have? The jewel wasp is a parasitic wasp, which means it primarily hunts one oh. kind of animal. In this case, tell us about wasp. it, Will. Bring bring us up to date. You didn't set it up like a mystery guy, but uh, help, tell us about the jewel wasp, Will. <laughs> What's yeah, that? Once the female has been impregnated, it okay. lays its eggs inside the bodies of a cockroach, and it gets. Mm. So much more. And like, what does it do to those cockroaches? Ever imagine? What does it do so they, they for reproduction? They find them it's by smelling ass. for them. They bite down on the cockroach's exoskeleton. Inject them. They inject them with a neurotoxic venom that oh paralyzes. Oh God! And then when the, the cockroach is paralyzed, it takes out a tiny little like syringe-like stinger and puts it into the brain <sighs> of the cockroach. At that point. It takes up to a minute for the the finger to go into like the proper whatever the cortex of a cockroach brain is, and it, it controls it so that it can no longer walk and it loses all of its ability to make its own choices, effectively turning it into a zombie. Yep, that's and great. And not to mention, not to mention, the jewel wasp is incredibly beautiful. It's got this green shiny exoskeleton that's absolutely stunning which gets it the name the jewel wasp and you'd never know that it is this absolutely ravenous terrible savage mother isn't this how everyone mates thank you daniel cool there's lots of comments people are very happy about this animal they hate cockroaches (laughs) love this animal i love you guys you listeners not you two despicable human beings good night everybody good night good night good night love you guys Bye. Bye.